when a decision is made that Jews are less than human and treated that way in words and deeds. I now know that is exactly the message Hamas sent. Never in the past we had such a clear-cut war of good versus evil, of people that are slaughtering babies versus people that are protecting their children in a shelter. There were children with just massive burns down their faces, down their necks, all over their limbs. And because the hospitals are so overwhelmed, they are being discharged immediately after. And they're being discharged to these camps with no access to running water. I lost more than 30 members of my immediate family and they were civilians. They were not part of any militant group. The, most of them were children, 17 of them are children. This is a terrorist organization which cannot be appeased. It needs to be defeated. I think it's true that a ceasefire only does one thing, it freezes the current conflict. And so whether in Ukraine or in Israel, if you're calling for a ceasefire, you're saying you're content with where things are right now. We are at 10,000 dead Palestinians. How many will be enough? <sighs> one of my colleagues just said all of them. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 8 of this Zion-tology series. You've just heard a variety of news clips on the recent violence in Israel and Palestine. The one universal here is the feeling of disgust this violence has provoked. The direction of that disgust, however, is anything but universal. Some people have felt it equally in both directions, whilst others have attached moral righteousness to one or the other side. There are also prescriptions. Some people contend Israel should immediately cease the bombing of Gaza, whilst others paint this as short-term thinking, which will leave Hamas in place and cost more lives in the long run. In previous episodes, I've looked at the rise of Zionist ideology and its implementation through Jewish land purchases in Palestine. Land purchases that were often illegitimate and left Arab farmers dispossessed. I've also looked at how, especially after the Balfour Declaration, Zionists acted in an increasingly belligerent manner and quite overtly proclaimed their intention to take over Palestine. In this episode, I'll look at how, just over a hundred years ago, this situation ultimately, and perhaps inevitably, turned to violence. The situation we are witnessing right now, whilst representing a dramatic escalation, is merely the continuation of a cycle of violence that began in the 1920s. At the turn of the 20th century, murders of Jews by Arabs were averaging around one every two years, and were overwhelmingly as part of criminal acts, not politically motivated. This started to turn around 1910, coinciding with large land purchases and widening Arab recognition of the Zionist agenda to take over Palestine. Specifically, this coincides with one of the Sursok land purchases which I spoke about in episode 5. The thousand Arabs thrown out of their homes saw the Zionists as being akin to European crusaders. In 1914, the British consul in Jerusalem reported that, quote, the assaults upon Jews in the outlying districts are increasingly frequent. End quote. How Jewish and Arab communities related prior to Zionism depends on who you listen to. Anti-Zionist rabbi David Weiss regularly refers to them looking after each other's children, the ultimate form of trust. Whereas Zionist historian Benny Morris claims that Palestinian Arabs treated the Jews in their midst with contempt. Zionists have equally been accused of speaking to Arabs in a contemptuous and patronizing way. I've no doubt that all of these conflicting positions are correct. It has to be remembered that we are talking about the late 19th century, where de facto slavery was a reality in the southern United States. It was a time when humanity did not have the same concept of a shared oneness superseding in-group loyalty. As I've previously discussed, after the First World War, the British took over with a mandate to support the Zionist project. The belief that the world's most powerful empire was backing them led Zionists to act with increasing belligerence. As I mentioned in the last episode, as early as 1918, Zionists were upsetting Arab sentiment by parading through the streets, announcing Palestine was now theirs. As a further example, Menachem Ussuskin, the acting head of the Zionist Commission, insisted to the Mayor of Jerusalem that invitations to a commemoration of the British conquest be printed in Hebrew. 
Ushers can claim that the recently revived language was spoken by the majority of Jerusalem's residents. This wasn't true, and the mayor interpreted the request as Zionists simply throwing their weight around. More sinisterly, Ushuskin told the mayor that the Jews were ready for war if their national demands were impeded. This must have been quite a lot to take, given that Ushuskin was a Russian who had only moved to Palestine the previous year. What I'm attempting to do here is convey the Arab perspective. In a moment, I'm going to describe some disgusting, gratuitous violence. Since October the 7th, it's not been off the table to suggest there's something fundamentally wrong with Arabs. Possibly because they are Muslims, they are more prone to acts of such violence than we would be. This in turn justifies the violence Israel inflicts upon them. As an example, the thing that stri struck me, you know, Piers, about seeing the 7th of October footage was that um, uh, even the Nazis were actually ashamed of what they did. You know, SS battalions who spent their days shooting Jews in the back of the head and pushing them into, tr uh, into trenches had to get very, very drunk in the evening to uh, uh, forget what they had done. Uh, the Nazi high command famously had to sort of get around the problem of soldier morale because the soldiers knew this wasn't exactly what their lives were meant to look like either. I tell you one very big difference. If you look at the footage, the raw footage, and I really hope people don't on a wider scale have to view what I viewed the other day. Um, if they see it, they will see something that is at least as barbaric as what the Nazis did. But here's the difference. They did it with glee. They were deeply proud. You see people um, uh, trying to, you know, taking the head off a young Israeli man with a shovel and then uh, calling their parents back in Gaza and telling them, father, father, I've killed two Jews, with my, ten, 10 Jews with my own hands. Get mother on the phone. I want to show, tell her how great a job her son has done. You know, I, I come back to this thing. I'm not exaggerating with this. It's very, very interesting and people need to realize you had this situation with uh, with the Nazis where they also were a genocidal anti-Semitic organization, but they tried to cover their crimes up. Hamas are actually proud of them. I'm not going to make a statement confirming or denying this. I think that's for the listener to decide. I would suggest the question to consider is not whether you personally would resort to such violence, but whether you think any subsection of your society would if they were met by a group of immigrants backed by a foreign power who were taking over their homeland and making no secret about it. I went over this dispossession more thoroughly in episode 5, Creating the Wandering Arab. The other question this raises, which runs right into the modern day, is what constitutes a morally legitimate and morally illegitimate response to such circumstances. Getting back to the narrative, throughout 1920 and 21, there were several independent incidents of violence which represented a massive escalation from anything that had gone on before. These events irreparably damaged Arab-Jewish relations, changed the nature of the Zionist project, and set the tone for the following hundred years. The first is known as the Battle of Tel Hay, which resulted, depending on how you count it, in the deaths of eight Jews and five Arabs. This violence wasn't intended and arose out of tension and misunderstanding as part of Arab resistance to the French in Syria. Arab soldiers entered a Jewish village searching for French troops. The resultant tension and misunderstanding led to shots being fired and people dying as a result. Whilst not a part of Arab violence directed at Zionism, it did raise the tension for what was to come the following month. The first event of major consequence was the Nebi Musa riot of 1920 which led to the deaths of five Jews and four Arabs, and injured over 200 Jews. Nebi Musa is an important religious festival in Palestine, attended by tens of thousands of Muslims. To keep order, the Ottoman authorities had deployed thousands of troops during the festival, but the British deployed less than 200. Events at Tel Hay had put the Jewish community on edge. The Zionist Commission had also received reports of an Arab terrorist group called the Black Hand, whose members intended to attack Jews to deter further immigration. Their warnings to the British authorities were unheeded, as they had made similar predictions the previous year, and nothing had happened. Zionist leaders decided to take matters into their own hands, and organised military drills in Jerusalem. Understandably so, 
But from the Arab perspective, the people who say they want to take over your country are now performing martial exercises in the streets. Trouble at the festival began with heated Arab rhetoric and anti-Zionist speeches. Some Arabs were said to be carrying slogans such as, Death to the Jews, and Palestine is our land and the Jews are our dogs. There is a report that violence broke out when Jews started throwing stones. Other accounts have Arab violence preceding that. Either way, Jerusalem was a tinderbox. A full-blown riot broke out and the Jewish quarter was ransacked. Cahil Sakakini, who would later become a famous Arab nationalist, was present and observed, quote, The people began to run about and stones were thrown at the Jews. The shops were closed and there were screams. I saw a Zionist soldier covered in dust and blood. Afterwards, I saw one Hebronite approach a Jewish shoeshine boy and take his box and beat him over the head. He screamed and began to run, his head bleeding, and the Hebronite left him and returned to the procession. The riot reached its zenith. All shouted, Muhammad's religion was born with the sword. I immediately walked to the municipal garden. My soul is nauseated and depressed by the madness of humankind. End quote. Jewish homes were looted and their occupants beaten, and in some cases murdered or raped. Historian Tom Segev describes this as the opening shot in the war for the land of Israel. This incident led to the formation of the Haganah, the Zionist paramilitary organization which ultimately became the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF. It's clear the British handled the whole situation very badly, so much so the Jews thought they had deliberately allowed it to happen. The British established a commission of inquiry, the Palin Commission, which I quoted in the last episode. Regarding the Balfour Declaration, it reported that, quote, It is impossible to minimize the bitterness of the awakening. Arabs considered that they were to be handed over to an oppressor which they hated far more than the Turks, and were aghast at the thought of this domination. Prominent people talked openly of betrayal, and that England had sold the country and received the price. End quote. The report also cited Zionist indiscretion and aggression as aggravating the fears of the Arabs. On the Zionist side, Joseph Klausner, an historian who had immigrated from Lithuania the previous year, wrote, quote, If the Arabs imagine that they can provoke us to war and that because we are few they will easily win, they are making a huge error. Our campaign will include all 13 million Jews in all the countries of the world, and everyone knows how many statesmen, how many opinion makers, how many people of great wisdom and great wealth and great influence we have in Europe and America. End quote. Tom Segev notes that, in addition to exploiting the image of the world dominating Jew, Klausner is uttering one of the first role reversals of Zionism. Instead of the Zionist project saving the world's Jews, the world's Jews are now called upon to save Zionism. This will be an important theme going forward. The next major incident, the Jaffa riots, would take place the following year. This time, 47 Jews and 48 Arabs would be left dead, with 146 and 73 wounded respectively. Hundreds more would be made homeless. The riots actually began as a conflict between two Jewish socialist groups on a May Day parade. The Jewish Communist Party got into a confrontation with the Labour Union Party. The former wanted a united Jewish Arab working class to overthrow the British whilst the latter advocated a Zionist nationalist form of socialism. A fight broke out, which led to gunfire. I'm unsure if this was from the socialists or the police. Hearing shots, Arabs believed they were under attack and went on an offensive. The violence was brutal. Men murdered Jews in their homes, which were then looted by women. The victims included children, with one account of a teenage girl being chased down and her head being beaten in with iron rods. Witnesses reported seeing both policemen and their own neighbours participating in the attacks. One woman at a hostel for immigrants, a symbolic target, reported fending off a policeman who tried to rape her. It should also be noted that some Arabs defended Jews and offered them refuge in their homes. After the riots, one Arab fruit and vegetable seller was issued with a note confirming he had helped save Jews so that he would be well treated by them. Tel Aviv residents also raised money for an Arab whose home had been damaged by his neighbours because he had sheltered Jews. The following day, the Haganah, the Jewish defensive organisation, launched reprisal attacks. These reprisals very much mirrored the Arab violence, with homes being looted and their occupants beaten to death, in some cases including women and children. 
at least one Jewish police officer is reported to have taken part. To the extent it was organized and not reactionary or purely opportunistic, the logic of the violence was to deter behavior from the other side. The Arabs thought that by attacking Jews, they would stop them wanting to come to Palestine. The Jews thought that by attacking Arabs, they would make them accept Zionism. Both sides were convinced that the other would capitulate to a strategy that they would never dream of capitulating to themselves. The Zionist publication Contras ran an article declaring the Age of Innocence had ended, and that, quote, To the extent that we shall have the breath of life in us, we will rejoice at the opportunity to spill our blood and the blood of others for a Jewish homeland, end quote. I've attempted to explain the Arab position as to why, whilst not universally condoning the violence, they felt they were defending their homeland from European invaders. The Zionists have a different context, which might be equally as compelling. At that moment in time, at least 100,000 Jews had just been murdered in Ukrainian pogroms as part of the Russian Civil War. The White Army killed Jews because they associated them with the Bolsheviks, whilst the Reds did so because they thought them to be bourgeois. Both sides killed them because they believed they hid gold, and it seems out of a pure sadistic pleasure. Zionists did not see this as an aspect of wartime violence that would die down. Rather, they predicted the Holocaust. In 1919, an article in the New York Times quoted Joseph Seth, the president of the Federation of Ukrainian Jews in America, as saying, quote, This fact that the population of six million souls in Ukraine and Poland have received notice through action and by word that they are going to be completely exterminated, this fact stands before the whole world as the paramount issue of the present day. End quote. Prior to the Times warning, the Literary Digest ran an article with the tagline, Will a slaughter of Jews be the next European horror? Whilst the Russian Red Cross issued a report which concluded, quote, The task that the pogrom movement set itself was to rid Ukraine of all Jews, and to carry it out in many cases by wholesale physical extermination of this race. End quote. Whilst many Jews in Western Europe found the Holocaust inconceivable before it happened, in the East this was not the case. It was predicted decades in advance, with the only surprise being that the Germans would be the ones carrying it out. This is then the stakes the Zionists were playing for. Whatever else it represented, Palestine was a lifeboat for a drowning people. The fact that there were already Arabs on that boat was of no consequence. They would treat them fairly, and there was room for everyone. Some Arabs had sympathy with the Jewish plight, but they weren't about to let them captain the ship. In the wake of the Jaffa riots, the British issued another commission of inquiry. The Haycroft Commission repeated many of the findings of the Palin Commission of the previous year. The report blamed the Arabs for the violence, but stated their grievances as being Zionists taking over government positions and Jewish immigrants offending the Arabs by their arrogance and by their contempt of Arab social prejudices. The report was also clear that bad feelings were not limited to Muslims, but that, quote, practically the whole of the non-Jewish population was united in hostility to Jews, end quote. On the other side, David Edda, the then head of the Zionist Commission, addressed the committee, stating that only Jews should be allowed to bear arms, and that, quote, there can only be one national home in Palestine, and that a Jewish one, and no equality in the partnership between Jews and Arabs, but a Jewish predominance as soon as the numbers of the race are sufficiently increased. End quote. A temporary limitation on Jewish immigration lasting a few months was imposed. In England, the Jewish Chronicle published a response to Haycroft, which captures what the Zionist sentiment towards Arabs now was. Quote, Imagine the wild animals in a zoological garden springing out of their cages and killing a number of spectators and a commission appointed to inquire into the causes of the disaster, reporting first and foremost that the animals were discontented with, and hostile to, the visitors who had come to see them. As if it were not the first business of the keepers to keep, to know the habits and dispositions of the animals, and to be sure the cages were secure. End quote. By contrast, British Jew Herbert Samuel, a long-time supporter of Zionism and Britain's first High Commissioner for Palestine, came to regard the Arabs as being in need of protection. He wrote that, as a Jew and an Englishman, he would be ashamed if it turned out that the establishment of a Jewish state involved injustice towards the Arabs, and that, quote, 
Nothing could be worse than if it were to appear that the one thing the Jewish people had learned from their centuries of their own oppression was to oppress others. End quote. Thank you for listening. I will conclude here. In the next episode, I will look at how these events changed the nature of Zionism away from the idealistic but wholly unrealistic vision of Theodore Herzl towards something more practical, but also more brutal too. I'll link to the various documents I've quoted in the info box, but in this episode, I've overwhelmingly drawn on Israeli historian Tom Segev's One Palestine Complete, and to a lesser extent on Benny Morris's Righteous Victims. For an account of the Ukrainian pogroms as a precursor of the Holocaust, I would recommend Jeffrey Wiedlinger's book, In the Midst of Civilized Europe. I'll also link to Daryl Cooper's podcast series, Fear and Loathing in the New Jerusalem, which is much longer than this one and really takes the listener into both the Arab and Jewish perspectives. My details are in the info box and any donations to keep the show going are greatly appreciated. Thank you very much to the people who have donated since last time. I've also included a link to Christian Aid's Gaza Crisis Appeal. Thank you.